our web and our last um, but then not the least of our presentations is Dr. Chinzia Cirillo from University of Maryland College Park and uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Cirillo. Um, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So I understand that we are all tired this um, lunchtime, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so this presentation is not um, um, on COVID, but the, the methodology that I'm proposing can be used to assess some of uh, the effect of COVID on um, low income and disadvantaged population that were uh, um, very much affected uh, by this pandemic. Um, so, um, why? all right, so um, what is the problem that I'm trying to, um, to um, address here? So we know that when uh, um, um, natural hazard or man-made man hazard happens, uh, those who suffer the most are uh, the vulnerable population. We have seen this in many occasions in the U.S., and this is also, also true in, in other countries. Um, so especially in this country, we assume that when something bad happens, people take their car and leave. But this is not possible for all people, especially those who are in um, disadvantaged uh, communities and have no car. Um, so in that case, we uh, what, what we needed to know is, um, where this, uh, how many of these low income people without car, um, are, uh, how many of these people uh, are out there? And uh, we needed to know uh, precisely where they live in order to um, coordinate um, the, the help. Well, um, although we are, uh, you know, a very advanced society, poverty in the US is still a problem. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau um, 2018 estimates, uh, there are about 13% of the population living in poverty. So this means that there are 14, about 40 million Americans living in poverty. So this uh, research is you know, founded by the center in Baltimore and there 24% of the population is living below the poverty line and uh, which is about the, the double of the national average. So from there, the motivation for this kind of studies. So it means that if something happens, if uh, in case of an evacuation, for example, one in four individuals will require some kinds of help uh, for evacuating or in an emergency situation. Um, on the top of this, um, now in uh, urban area, the new generation is trying to be less dependent from cars, so there will be more people without cars. So in this case, this kind of people, although not, not poor, um, should be provided with uh, a, an alternative to evacuate. So this is most, this is uh, a very recent data from uh, Hurricane Dorian that happens in 2019. And here you see, um, the, um, so Dorian affected four states, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. And um, you, you see here the, um, the, the vulnerable population, right? Those with income less than $25,000, which is um, below the poverty line, or elderly people, uh, people living in mobile home and household without a vehicle. So you would see that there are 350,000 people that needs that are below the poverty line who need some some help to get out um, of of the dangerous place, and there were about one hundred thousand people uh, without a car. So these people need help um, in the case of uh, an emergency due to a hurricane, for example. Um, so the, the other thing from from a point so this these are the facts that are motivating my research. Um, on the other side, uh, evidence shows that uh, when we plan for emergency, uh, often we don't take into account low income population. This is what um, this author found Bailey in 2007. So he surveyed the emergency response and evacuation plans in 20 metropolitan regions and found that uh, these were not um, accounting for minorities, low-income population, and careless households. 
Um, and this is consistent with some work done from a colleague of mine who worked recently in Texas for uh, some flooding related problem. And he found that uh, all the emergency plans out there uh, were not including um, uh, low income population and careless households. Um, now, um, so how I'm addressing this, I'm addressing this problem from a perspective of small area estimation. So why small area? Um, small area um, can be geographic area can be a geographical area or can be a domain, for example, a domain of social demographic characteristics. So my problem here is that I want to know how many low income people are in a certain area. And the smaller the size of this area, the better, because um, I can coordinate better my, um, my aid um, and plan how many vehicles I need, uh, at what time I need them, and how many people these vehicles are going to serve. However, uh, the data that we have about um, people um, is very sparse geographically. So for a small geographical area, we have very few observations from official surveys or no observation. So that's uh, why it motivated me to um, start this, um, um, this, this kind of research. So the idea to um, help people with transit during evacuation and to use micro simulation is kind of not new. Walshon has done a lot of studies about evacuation because I think he's in Louisiana. Um, he used Transims, which is an agent-based micro simulation transportation modeling software to generate the synthetic population for the area and study um, how many people um, should be helped with transit during evacuation. So I'm kind of, following this idea, uh, but with more advanced uh, statistical method to estimate uh, low income population at small geographic level. Um, so in order to run a micro simulation, um, you need to generate a synthetic population. So you want to, um, in, in micro simulation, you want to estimate, uh, you want to uh, calculate the the, the, the choices of each um, agent in the population. So you need to estimate a synthetic population. So um, the state of the art method for uh, synthetic population is um, the iterative proportional fitting, um, which, which uh, was first introduced in transportation by Beckman in 96, and it was used to, um, to feed the transients. However, IPF, uh, which is a data-driven uh, methodology, is quite old. It was developed in the 40s by the Census Bureau. And um, mainly uh, what IPF does is that you have a sample. Um, usually it's the American Community Survey. Um, and um, um, you allocate this um, uh, sample observation into the zone of interest. And, um, and you update the weights until um, the, the, the population that you are um, synthesizing matches some marginal, which are usually uh, given by the, um, the, 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 the Census Bureau. So the total marginals, the true marginals given by the Census Bureau. Well, here I have the calculation. So you start um, on, the, on the top on the left, you start from the sample and you have the marginal. So the, the orange part is the, the sample that you have in your, for example, American Community Survey. And the, the blue part are the marginals, which are from the Census Bureau. So you update, um, so you calculate weights to reweight the sample in order that at the end, um, when the, the, the method converges, um, you um, you matches uh, the sample reweighted with the marginals. So it's a purely data driven uh, methodology, and uh, it it proves to com it converges. There is a theoretical proof for that. However, there are a number of limitations that affect IPF, um, and um, one of the important limitation is um, that sometimes when you have too many characteristics to simulate. Um, and uh, a lot of zones, uh, some of these cells are zero. So if the cell is zero, you cannot produce a weight that gives a cell that is not zero. 
So this is the zero cell problems. And the, the more zones you have and the more characteristic you want to add to your synthetic population, the more of these zero cells you have. Uh, the, other, um, the other limitation was that um, people were synthetized, you can synthesize just at one level. Uh, for example, you can synthesize household characteristics or individual characteristics. And this was one of the limitations of the original model called, called IPF. Now, in transportation, uh, people have progressed and um, they have proposed the iterative proportional updating. Actually, this is um, implemented, the algorithm is implementing it in software, which is publicly available. This was a, a, a project sponsored by uh, FHWA. And now they are able to uh, synthesize population for both household and person categories. Um, and um, they can also accommodate control variables and multiple spatial resolution. For example, you can uh, um, take into account um, geographical level, for example, um, and county, for example. Now, um, so, um, um, uh, so when you are uh, synthesizing a population, you want, there are two important things that must, must be satisfied, two, two important um, um, criteria that must be satisfied. The first one is that um, the dependency between the attributes for each geographical area should be preserved. So if you have so many people with a certain income and a certain uh, age uh, in the sample, this should be preserved in the population that you are recreating. And the, the second criteria, the second criterion is that the cumulative distribution of the variable for all attributes of interest should be satisfied. Um, so we want to, these are the, the two main things that um, the population synthesis, a good population synthesis might be uh, might, um, satisfied. Now, um, um, so what is this small area um, problem I'm talking about? So suppose that this is your area of interest. So this is facing the ocean. So you have zones that are very dangerous. They are, uh, for example, at the high risk for flooding. And you have zones that are more in the internal side and are um, less, uh, less at risk. So um, you see that the big area B, um, maybe for this big area B, uh, you have enough sample uh, to, um, to, to produce um, a reliable synthetic population. But if you want to go, uh, but you see that B has a lot of heterogeneity in, in terms of risk, um, in terms of risk. So you want to uh, analyze the population at small geographical level, which are these A zones for which you have no sample or very few sample available. So this is my, in, uh, with the with with figure, my small area problem. So instead of uh, going for a completely data-driven um, methodology, here we, um, we, we go for a statistic methodology and in particular we use this copula function. Uh, these are mathem mathematical functions uh, that, um, that preserve the dependency between attributes of sample data and this is exactly what we want in the um, synthetic population. And, um, and then you can draw from this distribution in order to generate synthetic population that matches the marginal of the data. Uh, which we know from the census. Well, this is, um, maybe I can um, skip this. So this is the, um, the general uh, joint cumulative distribution function, which is a function. So the C is the copula function, which is uh, a function of the um, uh, cumulative distribution function of each characteristic in your population. So, what in, in, in a few words, um, what the copula does, uh, the copula uh, map the marginal distribution of a d-dimensional multivariate data to uniform distribution. So you have lots of characteristics of the population, for example, income, number of people in the household, um, you have um, living in urban or rural areas, so many people um, working in the household. So this is, these are all the 
this is a, a multidimensional, uh, this is a, a multi uh, this is multivariate data. So what Corbula does is that map the original uh, multivariate data to a uniform distribution. And there are the several empirical um, uh, copula function. Um, and, you know, uh, we use a basic one, uh, the Archimedean one, uh, that contains a lot of subfamilies. So you have this Clayton, Frank, Gamble, um, and the, these are very easy because they are unidimensional. This is just one parameter to estimate. You see this data? Um, this is the only parameter that you need to estimate. We have started from a basic function, but we plan in the future to use a more complicated function. So this is the basic um, uh, theorem uh, for copula. So as Claire showed that for any multivariate set of continuous variable, there is this at least one functional parametric form of the copula that can perform the mapping. The problem is that you see that this, um, this uh, theorem works for continuous variable, but in our uh, synthetic population, we deal with a lot of discrete variables, for example, um, an example of um, number of people in the household, the number of workers in the household, even income sometimes is provided um, with intervals. So um, this complicates a lot our methodology. I'm not going into the details of how makes it very complicated, but um, it, 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 it was not easy to adapt this theory to our um, population synthesis generation. So we estimated the parameter of the function with just um, weighted uh, log likelihood function. And, um, and then we test uh, if the copula belongs to that family using um, a um, non-parametric bootstrapping um, methodology. Okay, so in synthesis, uh, what do we do to generate this synthetic population? So uh, we have a sample. So we calculate the rank of the variables. Then we calculate the pseudo observation based on this ranking. We fit the copula. We perform the good and of fit. Once we have the, the copula function, we draw um, the, the second number of observation according to the uh, marginals given by the census. Um, so we st then you see we start from a sample, which is small, and we um, and we produce the synthetic population that is B. All right, um, so maybe this, is, this will be more interesting for you. So we have an application. Um, so we have, uh, focused on a county um, and uh, I live in Anne Arundel County, so I'm biased. So I've chosen Anne Arundel County for that. Um, and we had a, a, a number of natural hazards recently. Uh, we had the tropical storm in 2003, recent, well, 2003 and um, a number of hurricanes. Um, um, a number of hurricanes. So, but the methodology is very general. So we we kind of uh, do this. For, we have done this for each county in uh, in Maryland, and we have uh, four. Um, I don't remember how many counties. No, we have. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe less than 10. Okay, so you see the special um, uh, definition of the problem. So you have a county level problem. In each county level, we have uh, four pumas. In, in each in, in Amerindia country, we have four pumas. Um, and pumas are the base of the special base for American community survey. So you have enough information in uh, the American community survey to estimate a copula function uh, for a puma. And you have many census tracts. So my objective was to um, have a population um, estimated at census tract level for Anne Arundel County. And in particular, estimate how many people are low income and how many of these people have no car. Um, so we, we, uh, we, our population um, is characterized by nine attributes and you will see that we have both household attributes and, um, um, and we have individual attributes. So we know the characteristic of the household and we know the characteristic of the people in this household. 
The other thing that is different from other studies, you see that here we have nine um, attributes. Usually population synthesis are based on four, six attributes, but you see that the more attributes you have, the better you can characterize our pop um, population. Um, so you see that many of these things are very important. For example, income is a determinant for all kinds of um, uh, choices um, and for the characterization of demand. We were talking about demand before. Uh, we have race, uh, we have um, uh, employment status and, and, the, and the usual one, age, gender. So what are the data that we used for this? So we used uh, several data sets. Um, so we use the American Community Survey, as I was saying. So this can be also seen as a data fusion method in which we take um, data from several databases and we fusion them to estimate um, the characteristic of the population. So we use the American Community Survey, the decennial census, uh, the National Household Travel Survey, and we use IRS income data. So why IRS income data? Because the decennial census does not include um, income. So the decennial census doesn't give you income. And uh, so this is a big limitation because we needed the marginal for incomes. And um, so we used this IRS income data, which is provided by IRS at zip code level. So this was very useful information for us. So, but in order to process all this data, you need to have some geographic consistency and you need to have cross work between county, um, county, um, Pumas, census tracts and zip code level. So all this should go into a data fusion method that does all this cross work across different um, databases. So the other problem that we had um, is that um, although Maryland participated into the National Household Travel Survey as add-ons, so we have more data this year. So the National Household Travel Survey was collected in 2017. And Maryland um, provided extra money to collect more data. And we have about 1,400 households, uh, data for 1,400 households available. However, um, Maryland has not been able to release um, geographic details about um, their data. So we know that all these observations are in Maryland, but we have no idea where these people are. And we know that many of these people are in the Eastern Shore, um, which is, you know, their behavior is probably different from urban Maryland. So this was another big issue here, and we were able kind to overcome this limitation by using this method. Okay, so we fitted the, um, the, 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 a copula for each of these Puma. We found out that the Clayton was the one that was um, fitting better out data. And then once we added the, the, the general function, uh, we uh, generated a set of observation for each census tract by matching um, the totals with the 2010 essential uh, census. And we found that this was, um, 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 was um, fulfilling all, all our statistical tests. We were pretty um, satisfied with the results. Now, so, um, so all the, the copula stuff has been uh, estimated on American Community Survey, IRS data, and um, decennial census. Now, this is where the National Household Travel Survey comes into play. So with the National Household Travel Survey at the statewide level, we uh, estimated um, uh, how many people do not have, ac have access to a car in the household. And um, uh, so we estimated just a binomial logic in which the, uh, the characteristic were um, income, um, race, um, number of children in the household and work in, uh, in the household. So this is the, 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 the model, again, estimated at the statewide um, level uh, because we have no geographical information on where these people are. And you see that the variables are reasonable and, um, and significant. So the, the richer you are, the more, more you have access to a car, 
And this race is, I think, one is Afro-American and the other one is Asian. You see they are negative when compared to uh, white people. Uh, and we calculated the probability of having access to a car um, given this utility fund. And finally, these are the results of our um, so of our uh, um, the results from our synthetic population. So you see here you have Anne Arundel County, and here we show the two variables of interest. So people being low income and people not having access to a car. So you see that uh, people, uh, low income people um, rate varies uh, from 12.5 to as high as 30%. You know, and we see that, we, we think that this makes kind of sense because um, the part that are darker are closer to the border with Baltimore. Uh, and we have some pocket of poverty down um, in Anorundel town. And the green dots are people uh, without a car. And you see that this varies from 2% to about 11%. And there is a correlation between um, income and um, people without cars. So by constructing, so at the end, the product of this research is that by constructing this kind of maps, we give to um, local jurisdiction um, a tool that uh, tells them uh, where po poor people are and um, where people without a car are. So as I was saying, this can be used also for COVID. We, I've, I, we have not done this, but we could map uh, the cases of COVID and see um, how this matches uh, low-income people. I'm, I'm sure there will be a very high correlation. Okay, so um, just to conclude, um, so we have um, demonstrated that um, a statistical approach for synthetic, for synthetic population is uh, possible. Um, instead of using this um, um, completely data-driven um, uh, method. And also we have uh, done this at small geographical level, which is something that uh, was not possible before because of the lack of um, um, sample in official uh, survey data. And the results are uh, encouraging um, and um, you know, we, we plan to do more with this. Um, so, well, a little bit more about what we, um, we are doing with this. So we want to use this result to optimize transit during evacuation. So to plan how many buses or um, cars we need uh, to rescue these people. Um, so again, we can use the small area estimation of disadvantaged population for other application, COVID, access to jobs and opportunity, access to transit integrate this uh, synthetic population based on copula into micro simulation and develop a large scale transportation model for the state of Maryland based on MATSI, for which I have a very nice picture here. So this is um, the, the, the network of Maryland um, in MATSIM. So we, we, have, we are close to have a final run of um, the entire um, demand model for Maryland running on MATSIM. And this is based on uh, the synthetic population that I've just um, illustrated. And this ends my presentation. Um, I'm open to questions. This this isn't, I mean, this is more of an editorial comment than a technical question, but I just can't believe this this isn't done more. Um, you know, finding where people are going to need extra help because they don't, I mean, how can you just plan for evacuation assuming everybody has a car? So again, that's more of an editorial comment. I, I think this is really important research because um, it, 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 and you also make an excellent point you know, we tend to think of people without cars as being poor, but also a lot of millennials choose to not have a car, live in a place where they don't have to have a car, and they will also be equally vulnerable. Yeah, I, I was surprised as well. Um, and this problem is coming uh, up again and again. Um, 
yeah, this, I mentioned this colleague of mine, he did work in Texas, and uh, he said exactly the same, that the low income population are not accounted for uh, in this uh, emergency plan. Um, good afternoon, this is uh, Petronella James. I'd like to make a comment, maybe not a question, but um, very, very good work. I, I was very inspired by what you have reported, but I also wanted to make, I noticed on maybe your uh, future work and conclusion um, slide, you did mention COVID and the relationship, right? And understanding um, people who don't have cars and who might be in low income brackets or, you know, the different income yeah. levels. Um, one of the things that came out recently, as you know, there's a, a whole issue about inequitable access to COVID um, resources. And for example, people trying to get the vaccination or going to get a COVID test and so on. And so one of the things that I, I saw in a report somewhere was in, in a community, in, in some, I don't remember where it took place, but this is something to consider. I know you're looking at evacuation, but how do we get those resources to people who are in those low income communities who don't have cars or you know other communities, and so one of the, the the solutions I saw in a report was they're actually looking at like mobile COVID vaccination, um, so they take that to the community. Yeah, this is a very interesting. This is a follow up that we are trying to pursue because we want to use these results, you know, by knowing where these people are and which needs they have, uh, you can kind of optimize the. The, the, the aid system, for example, certain communities you can send, if they cannot reach the opportunities, you go there, right? If they cannot get testing or the vaccine, then you need to send people there. So you need to know how many vaccine, um, how many tests you need in that area. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is, this work is kind of um, as many possible uh, avenue for application. And, and I think this is, the, the, the pandemic is one of them. Yeah, and it also just brought something to mind because um, previous presenters talked about transit and, and the fact that, so, so typically in some, you know, marginalized communities, low income and other communities, people will be looking to use transit, but now with reduced services in some places and hesitation. So even, you know, further challenge for people to get access to those um, health, not just for COVID, but for other health um, issues that they may have. So definitely. Very true, very true. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Cirillo and uh, all the thank attendees. You.